since we were here last time in Greenland, the U.S. has opened a diplomatic mission in Nuuk. Since uh, the last assembly in Reykjavik uh, last year, we have a monumental bill being introduced into the U.S. Senate. We have the announcement uh, a few days ago that there might, can I say, finally be a U.S. ambassador or a special envoy to the Arctic. And as was explained by the Prime Minister of Greenland, we have witnessed a new engagement at the highest level in Washington with the leadership of this country, which has never happened before. Never happened before. And as I said earlier, uh, the fact that the Secretary of State, uh, while the missiles were flying between Gaza and Israel, was engaged in extensive visit and dialogue with the leadership of Greenland. Uh, if you only needed one indicator of change, that's it. So, let me, as an invitation to your opening remarks, each for each of you, put the question, what's going on in Washington and the US with respect to the Arctic? And, and what can we ex expect in the coming months and years. So I think I will just take, starting here on my right, and uh, let each of you speak to that. Uh, the microphones are on the, should, can we get an additional microphone here to, to the stage, please? I think you don't have to turn it on, you can just start, please. Yeah. Great, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, and thank you for holding this panel, which I think does represent really the breadth and depth of U.S. Uh, involvement um, in the Arctic. Uh, I'm Doug Jones, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State with responsibilities for Northern Europe, uh, including the Arctic. I may be the additional four, I don't know. I don't yeah. think I was on the list. Um, but I think uh, you have chosen a great topic. It's true, uh, the U.S. Um, role in the Arctic is evolving. Uh, but I think it's also important to recognize that uh, we're also uh, quite um, consistent. We do have a vision uh, for the Arctic that we are uh, seeking uh, to achieve. Uh, you know, we envisage an Arctic uh, free of conflict, uh, one where uh, nations act responsibly, where um, economies and resources can be developed sustainably and transparently uh, with respect to the, to the environment and uh, to the cultures and interests of our local um, and indigenous uh, populations. And uh, we're seeking uh, to achieve this really with a comprehensive approach throughout the U.S. government that touches on all of our U.S. interests. So uh, climate, security, safety, um, scientific research, um, economic development. Um, and, uh, and also, uh, we believe uh, profoundly that a part of this is bolstering and enhancing uh, international standards and rules um, and bolstering uh, the rules-based international order. So uh, I'd say just briefly, I think there's two things that are driving our evolving role. It's climate change and it's uh, rising geopolitical uh, competition. Uh, we, we, I think this group knows very well the impacts of, of, of climate change, but this has profound implications for all of us. Um, and, um, and on the security front, we also see um, important changes with um, Russia's uh, increased uh, military activities uh, adding to tensions, uh, which is, takes on an entirely new significance in light of uh, this unprovoked aggression in Ukraine, uh, which is an assault not only uh, on the Ukrainian people, but on the core principles that have uh, been the foundation of the international rules-based order. Uh, the principles of sovereignty, territorial integrity, respect for borders, uh, these are uh, principles that have underpinned the rules-based order that has provided security for the transatlantic space um, for the last 75 years, um, including in the Arctic, uh, which has, you know, where the, where the rules-based order has really been the foundation for security um, and, 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 and prosperity. So there are important implications here. Um, and and I, would, I, I would add, we also, um, we've talked about uh, the PRC, and uh, they are also seeking to uh, undermine and, and reshape uh, the rules of the international uh, rules-based order. And so when we see the 
PRC's uh, coercive uh, economic uh, policies, attempts to gain control of critical infrastructure uh, through economic assistance or um, scientific cooperation that has both military as well as civilian um, applications. These are uh, concerns to us and, and we all need to think about ways to, to address this. But as the United States, we are approaching this uh, comprehensively. As you said, we have uh, reopened our consulate here in Nuuk in 2020, 70 years after our original consulate uh, closed. Uh, we are uh, creating the position of an Arctic ambassador at large to give uh, this important region the attention and focus it deserves. Uh, you've talked also about uh, Secretary Blinken's, one of his first trips being uh, to uh, Greenland and the Arctic uh, Council uh, as an important example. Uh, we remain the leading uh, country focused on um, Arctic research. Uh, and we're increasing our capabilities elsewhere to remain engaged. We're um, planning to build three new polar security cutters uh, for the Coast Guard to increase our capabilities there. Uh, we are investing in NATO as our most important alliance um, and um, an alliance that's focused uh, not only on the um, traditional security that may first come to your mind when you think of military, but in it's in increasingly adapting um, to focus on um, new and emerging threats to security. And this includes the consequences of climate change, um, cyber threats, hybrid threats, including disinformation, um, threats from emerging and disruptive technologies. So, um, and my final point, I would just say we're also deeply engaged in international cooperation, including through the Arctic Council. So, even at a time when Russia's um, aggression makes cooperation with Russia impossible now in the Council, uh, in June, the other seven members uh, did agree to continue cooperation on Arctic Council projects uh, that do not involve Russia. So uh, we remain highly focused on this region. Um, it's a dynamic region, change is coming fast, but, uh, but it certainly has our, intention, our attention and engagement. Great, Mike. Thank you, President Grimson. Let me just piggyback on, on the comments laid out by uh, Des Jones here. Uh, you asked what's new. Since, since October, when we had a similar panel about what's the U.S. doing, uh, maybe a bit of a report out and a reminder to all of us who, who were there, and I, it's good to see all my friends and colleagues here. Uh, I think from October until today, I would call it a continuity of commitment. You heard a commitment on that stage several months ago about what the United States was going to do. We uh, absolutely have pushed forward on research. The U.S. Arctic Research Commission that I have the honor of chairing have five goals. I won't bore you with the details because you've already heard them today. Infrastructure, health and well-being, research, partnerships, climate change. Those are the themes that we will carry forward as a commission to guide U.S. efforts in Arctic research. But it's a, it's a continuity of commitment, the standing up of the Arctic Executive Steering Committee to the point about re-engaging and then uh, kind of embedding this into the DNA of the federal government. It's already there, but those, that part of the Venn diagram together. Uh, later on, you'll hear from my colleague, General Key, about the standing up of the Ted Stevens Center in Anchorage. Again, another pillar of enduring commitment to the Arctic. Uh, if you think about all the issues we face together, different parts of the federal government have taken those, but the continuity, the integration between all of those together, whether it's investments in NOAA, investments in Arctic Research Commission, investments in diplomacy, certainly our consulate here in Nuuk, that's changed. The announcement yesterday of a leadership position for the federal government for the United States, uh, that's another one. So there's been blocks laid since last October, what I can report on all fronts, those are actually moving forward. What's different here as well is that they are coordinated. There's an integration. We talk all the time, and the last thing I will say before we come back, perhaps to some other goals, is that soon, maybe in a month or two, who knows when, but soon, the federal government of the United States will have a national strategy for the Arctic region. That's a good thing to have, have a strategy, but moving forward is not, doesn't come out of a strategy on a paper comes forward by effort and movement. And what you're seeing is, are the precursors to that. You're seeing effort being laid in several parts of the federal government to actually continue to lead in the Arctic, to work with partnerships, to rely on partners. And the final thing I'll say ancillary to that is, boy, there's no place more emblematic of the new north than right here in Greenland. I can crosswalk almost every member of the federal family for the US government, and we have some interest, effort, initiative going on right now vis-a-vis -vis Greenland and our partners in the north and outside of the north. But Greenland, emblematic of the new north, whether it's indigenous, uh, indigenous peoples, 
climate change, you know, the National Science Foundation has invested, is investing, and will continue to invest a lot in Greenland because it impacts the globe, because it impacts U.S. interests as well. So I can go on, I will not, aside from saying what you heard in October, it's actually moving forward, and I would say quicker and more comprehensive than even we had shared back in October. Uh, great. I, I find myself in violent agreement with uh, the two gentlemen that have just spoken. Uh, I do think continuity is really the key theme. And if there's one takeaway, I hope that's what it'll be for all of you. But let me flesh it out a little bit more as well. Uh, we've heard a bit about the top lines on the strategy, uh, what the U.S. and its own uh, strategic interests see. But it goes beyond that. Uh, we're opening a consulate here. We've opened a consulate here. It's not simply a consulate. You'll notice that there is representation from USAID, my old agency. Why? Because we want to be here and work with Greenlanders on such matters as sustainable development and taking on issues of infrastructure. A, uh, a political mentor of mine once said, that people need to know that you care before they care what you know. And I think what you're seeing uh, up here and what you've heard about in terms of the rapid developments in recent months is an effort by the U.S. government, multi-sectoral, really across the U.S. government, in finding ways to walk with our partners in the Arctic to help take on mutual challenges, but also to realize mutual goals, because there's so much that we can all take on together, which is good for everyone. In terms of the Wilson Center and our commitment, uh, we of course, uh, the founding director is Mike Schrager, founded our Polar Institute, and part of the deal when he went to be, when he, when he got the call and answered the call to chair the Arctic Commission for President Biden, he continues to serve as the chair of our Polar Institute. Uh, from our perspective, not only does that mean that we get his thoughts on strategic direction, but it helps us better integrate with the overall vision of the Biden administration. And again, we think that's a good thing. Uh, we are doubling down on our own work at the Polar Institute. In fact, I can uh, announce today, and this is the first time we've actually announced it publicly, that Dr. Becca Pincus, known by many of you, will serve as the new director of the Polar Institute in just a couple of weeks' time. I suspect that you'll see her coming up soon. Uh, so that's our way of showing how important this is to all of us. We hope to extend on the Greenland Dialogues. And then the other aspect of it, the role that the Wilson Center can play that helps to stand on the shoulders of what you've just heard, we spend a lot of time meeting with policymakers in the U.S. We go to the Hill very often. We talk with the White House very often to help flesh out what it is that we see, uh, to be there to be able to respond, and, and to make sure that this very dynamic part of the world, so very important in so many ways, is better understood by those who need that understanding in order to make decisions and, and move forward. So from our perspective, as uh, you heard Mike say, it is very much continuity of effort. Well, before you start, let me uh, thank the Wilson Center for how you have served the Arctic in recent years. Uh, I sometimes say that even if the US doesn't yet have an Arctic ambassador, the Arctic has an embassy in Washington, uh, known by the name of the Wilson Center. <laughs> And it's been very important to have this kind of a base and a dialogue and, and, and the meetings and conferences that you have organized during not just the Biden administration, but also before. But now we have a new institution uh, as well, which I, I think all of us are very interested in learning more about and how it's going to function in the, in the coming years. Please. Mr. President, thank you. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, my name is Church Key. I have the privilege of serving, serving as a senior advisor for Arctic Security Affairs for the Ted Stevens Center for Arctic Security Studies. And you're going to ask yourself, so what is a senior advisor for Arctic Security Affairs at this new center? I am the de facto director. We just got to wait till the center is established in the U.S. Federal Register. 
and then I'm going to be formally designated as the director of this new center. And uh, it is a privilege to stay in formation with Daz Jones, my good friend, dear, dear friend Mike Schrager, and Ambassador Green in this panel with you today because there is continuity across the, the U.S. commitment to the Arctic region. I'm part of the soft power investment of part as, uh, the overall security dimensions as the U.S. takes hard stock and continues to add investments in both the hard and soft power capabilities of the, of the devol developing Arctic security landscape. Obviously, when we look at the hardware pieces, you have things such as F-22s, F-35s, polar security cutters. This summer, creating the 11th Airborne uh, Division Arctic uh, at Joint Base Somdorf Richardson and more. So there has been good investment of the United States into defending our national interests with allies and partners across the Arctic region. It is America's asymmetric advantage to have the remarkable relationships of both the North American Aerospace Defense Command, NORAD, as well as NATO. And NATO at potentially 32 will be even better than NATO at 30 from my respective vantage. This continued investment, though, in what a Stevens Center does is a soft power complement to the hard power investments of the Department of Defense in and around the Arctic region. It is both a tool of policy and security cooperation. It is focused on networks and solutions. It is really looking to create synergies in both research and analysis, practitioner-focused education, and then, of course, engagement and outreach uh, with allies and partners in and across the Arctic region, but also representing those, those countries that have Arctic interests from the Indo-Pacific as well as European th the European theater. Obviously, working with our allies and partners in, that are part of the NATO alliance is a, is a high priority for us. We are aligned to United States Northern Command, so therefore part of America's homeland defense posture and really thinking through the challenges that are facing our homeland defense posture. But we're also about supporting the rules-based order in the Arctic region, specifically around security practitioners. It is, of course, looking to take, uh, to add, throw weight to climate security challenges through research analysis as well as strategic engagement. We are looking to create investment uh, in the allies and partners in things such as exercises, simulations, workshops, seminars, both at, at our new center located at Joint Base Elmwood of Richardson as our hub, but realistically networked across the Arctic region. I say from the Seward Peninsula to Rovimini, Finland, working with our allies and partners across the Arctic spaces is defined by those boundaries at this point to create solutions, advancing networks, and realistically creating a dialogue forum for practitioners to come together to think through what are the daunting challenges facing our allied efforts in across the Arctic to deter and dissuade and make put real throw weight behind those terms to cause those who have threatened the, ally, the allies and partners network in and around the Arctic say, no, today, today's not the day to mess with this alliance. We're helping to add bench strength to the thinking on this aspect for planning and more. It is, though, about partnerships. So, for example, uh, Mr. President, partnerships with our colleagues in Washington, D.C., such as the Wilson Center, will be conducting and partnership events about the Arctic with our dear colleagues in, at the Wilson Center, continuing the work that Dr. Schreg and I did when we were working the Arctic Security Dialogues between an organization I used to chair and when Mike was serving as the director of the Wilson Center Polar Institute. We're concerned, though, about geophysical to geostrategic because operators live in that space, and the Arctic is very different when you think about the, the challenge that practitioners face when the weather is daunting, risks are high. So not only we're trying to be a tool for that geostrategic aspect, but then also take research that really breaks it down to reduce the risk that practitioners face in the airs and the ground on the sea. That's a starting point, Mr. President. Well, thank all of you for this enlightenment. And uh, let me first ask the hall, yes, uh, well, you put a good question to the Asian representatives, huh? so I'm trust giving you the floor again in, in the spirit that you will, you will measure up also, yes. Rasmus. Thank, you. Thank you very much. My name is Rasmus Bertelsen from Arctic University of Norway, Tromsø, and University of Akureyri. Uh, so the Arctic played a key role in U.S.-Soviet nuclear mutual deterrence during the Cold War. So my question is, 
current and future US-Russia and US-China nuclear mutual deterrence strategic stability. My question is, what role does the United States see its missile defense infrastructure in Alaska, Tula, Greenland, and Vardø, northern Norway, and deployments uh, in the Barents region and deployments near the Russian Far East? What role do you see of, for that in the US-Russian nuclear strategic stability and how do you think this infrastructure and these deployments affect that nuclear strategic stability? Thank you. Any volunteer? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Rasmussen, one of these days we're going to get you to start asking simpler questions. <laughs> um, first of all, uh, Rasmussen is uh, one of our adjunct uh, faculty that supports our practitioner education program called the Arctic Region Security Orientation Course which is uh, for a center that just achieved its initial operating capacity on the 1st of July. We just conducted our opening ceremony on the 11th of August. Uh, this uh, next week, we'll start our educating the, up to the next 75 uh, professionals that are both U.S. and allied in the fundamentals of Arctic security. Uh, at the end of the next week, we'll have 300 total that we've conducted in this capacity, the first of more than 25 uh, sort of educational programs we're trying to conduct that really spans geostrategic, geophysical, but also includes Arctic indigenous, getting those insights from people who've been in the region since time began. So I'm gonna to try to tackle your question, but there's a lot of answers to your question, and realistically, we'd have to have a classified discussion to get at this purposefully. But in an unclassified form and, and sort of a set of reflections, let me just ask, answer with this. The United States, of course, maintains a, a very strong security defense posture with our allies and partners to include those elements that are necessary under NORAD for, for North American aerospace defense. And realistically, the capabilities with our Canadian allies in, under NORAD are there to deter and dissuade in order not have to get in the business of defeating those who, who have aggression coming to us from across the Arctic Basin. The capabilities that we work with our allies in and across Europe are the same, to, again, to deter and dissuade in order to then ha ha not have to get in the business of defending. Without getting into step by step of what each system does, because then we could get into a classified discussion. Realistically, we need to know for, for the general population, the posture capabilities of, of our allies and partners that are really worried about the sovereign territory of not only our respective homelands, but when you think about NATO and, and the, both the elements of Article 4, which each nation is responsible for its own defense, in order to help prevent, help prevent, if you will, an Article 5 declaration where we all have to come to the defense of those, those who have been attacked. So it is about having a tough shield and it is about deterrence and dissuasion with real capability so that, again, decision makers who are in the ad adversarial camp say, so, you know what, today, again, is not the day to mess with this very strong allied formation of 30 strong allies. Again, hopefully later this year, be fully seeing 32 in that equation set. Again, that's about as best I can do without getting in trouble there, Erasmus. I've uh, just add a few words to that. Um, in deterrence and defense and the need for a strong deterrence and defense is more important, you know, as we confront. And we see, as Russia has made clear that it's, willing to use force um, to achieve its aims. And as we confront, I think, the greatest threat to transatlantic security um, since the end of the Cold War. So um, it is important um, that, uh, and you've seen NATO react. Um, NATO has strengthened deterrence and defense and been clear. NATO is a defensive alliance. It does not seek uh, confrontation or, or conflict uh, with Russia and is not a threat to Russia. Uh, but any, any um, threat or attack to uh, NATO territory will be met with a, with a divisive response. And um, President Biden has been clear that Article 5 is a sacrosanct commitment, and we will uphold it. And we've been clear in, in communicating that. Um, and that applies, I think, the, the, the need for strong deterrence and defense is important in the conventional as well as the nuclear uh, fields, as you're talking about. The um, missile defense systems that you refer to um, are, are, are aimed um, primarily at, you know, rogue attack from North Korea, um, in our case, um, also the European uh, defense of NATO is uh, for um, Iran, 
Uh, they do not have the cap capacity um, to um, deal with uh, the scale of uh, capability that, that, that Russia has. Um, but uh, we have been um, clear that um, the nuclear deterrent remains strong and in place as well. We have seen some irresponsible uh, statements from, uh, from President Putin um, hinting at, um, at, at nuclear capability, uh, and uh, I think that that has um, uh, no place, but we have uh, been clear and will continue to be clear uh, that NATO is as strong as, as, as united as ever and we'll uh, continue to uh, strengthen our deterrent, our conventional and, and nuclear deterrent to make sure it's in place to provide for our common security. Yeah, yeah if I might, as the person on the panel who has the least direct connection to uh, the Biden administration, let me offer a couple of additional thoughts. I find it interesting when we talk about China and Russia, when they're unhappy with the U.S., the first thing they do is back out of talks on topics which should be in everyone's interest. So China walks away from climate change discussions if they're unhappy with Nancy Pelosi speaking, uh, visiting Taiwan. Russia backs away from discussions on nuclear weapons if they don't like what's taking place in Ukraine. And there's an old adage in my old line of work in development, and that is you can't want it more than they do. And so I think as we talk about these key challenges, it is clear that we have up here the U.S., which is seeking to work closely with allies in the region to advance a rules-based order. And we also have actors who, if they don't like something, they immediately stop discussions about a rules-based order. Our time is kind of running out, but yeah, Kupi. Could we have the microphone here, please? Here. Here. Hi. I'm representing uh, Inuit Circumpolar Council. My name is Gubik van der Zee Kleist. And I'll, uh, I'll put a much simpler question to you. Um, now, since we are in Greenland and we have known the especially the military presence of the U.S. Uh, through decades uh, in Greenland. I would like to ask you to elaborate a little bit about uh, the current situation and not at least uh, what, you, what you are planning for the future with respect to... Um, yeah, we heard in the press that uh, the U.S. is together with uh, Denmark and Greenland is planning to set up new radars, for instance. I don't know if it's true or not, but uh, could some of you elaborate a little bit on that? Thank you. Just for you and the panel, Kubi Kleist was the Prime Minister of Greenland when it got the shell government in 2009. So. First Doug and then I'll go. Great. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, we do have, as we know, military um, presence here in Greenland that plays an important role in the uh, missile defense systems that uh, we had we talked about. Um, it's also um, important um, um, Arctic uh, security presence and uh, also for uh, maritime uh, domain awareness. It's a very important. Um, so uh, we have, uh, you know, plans to continue uh, the presence. Uh, and uh, as far as the things you mentioned, um, we don't have um, plans for major um, um, expansions. We have uh, routine maintenance going on. We are um, talking with the um, um, governments of uh, Greenland and Denmark um, on this uh, radar survey, which we have conducted um, uh, as a potential way to also increase uh, domain awareness. And I think that study is is, is progressing, but we have no, nothing further um, on that at this, at this time. Perhaps if I just have one more minute, Mr. Yeah. President. Um, I know it's a great question, and I know that when the United States shows up in the North or maybe anywhere, the default questions are always about hard power, secu hard security matters, like we just heard. It's, it's a great question. It's a part of the relationship. Uh, it should not be ignored, I, but I do think it should be placed in context. And, and if I were uh, an ally and partner of the United States, I would want to know if I have that agreement with them that they're going to be with me 100%. And I, and I believe that the United States has demonstrated that, at least in terms of what you've heard here. 
but I, I really do, you know, as many of my colleagues, I'm looking at them and I watch them present, but we should not lose sight of what's happening here. And that is that, yes, it is about security and, and military issues, of course it is, especially what's happening with the war on Ukraine. But so much of what we heard today, what we will hear this afternoon, this evening, and tomorrow, is I think the place where we double down in times of trouble. And we have big headwinds right now, and that's in the cooperative nature of the Arctic. That's in Arctic research. That's in understanding what does sustainability mean for us. That's about creating stable environments so venture capital comes north and invests in our people and workforces. It's about building a north. It includes the security components, absolutely. But we're, you and I, we're all talking about a sustainable, productive, cooperative, a rich north that we all want to see. And as a resident of Alaska, as an Arctic resident, that's what I want to see. Yes, I want to know that my homeland is secure, it's defended, and I have allies and partners that will stand with me. I also want to know that that mother in Imanuk has a work has work that can feed her family, that that community can grow in the ways in which they want to grow, that they have the right to have indoor plumbing like I have in the great big city of Fairbanks. All of those things are what we're talking about. So not to diminish this matter at all, it is a really important issue, it's an investment, it's a driver, but there's a bigger context that you've brought us together for, and that is to build our north the way we would like our north to be built. So, uh, so finally, let me leave this question with you. If you want to comment on it, uh, you're welcome. But if you simply want to take it away, that's OK as well. Before you came on the stage, we had a session on the view from Asia. And as we see uh, through the growth of the Arctic Circle is the increasing engagement of Asian countries, uh, not just China, but Japan, Korea, India, Singapore, and others in the Arctic. We hear very little from Washington about what is the American view of this growing engagement of Asia in the Arctic. And let me say again, it's not just about China, it's about the multitude of other Asian countries. And as I said before, we have just learned from India that there will be a formidable delegation from India at the Arctic Circle Assembly in, in October. And I noticed in the way you presented the, the current state of play, I don't think any of you mentioned Asia in this way. So my question is really this, uh, to what extent has Asia started to figure into the Arctic policy and the Arctic planning of the United States, especially given the growing concern and interest in other Asian affairs in Washington? And, and if you have short comments on this, we would, we would welcome them. I see you are ready to, to give us one, so please. First of all, it's a great question, and it certainly compliments the, the great presentations uh, for, from our ambassador from Japan and, and Singapore. Uh, this is one, one part of the solution, just one part. Uh, the Stevens Center is part of a network of family of regional centers, which includes the Daniel K. Inoue Center for Asia Pacific Security Studies located at Fort DeRussi in Waikiki, Hawaii. So for our vantage point, within the family of regional centers, we'll work through our colleagues uh, there at the Inuit Center to integrate the thinking about the dimensions of our security from the Indo-Pacific in collaboration and in partnership with our dear friends in Hawaii. Strategically, it's rising tide floats all boats. So when those people are really looking at uh, across the Indo-Pacific that are looking to be a force of good in and around the Arctic region, Let's try to find the best way to work collaboratively to achieve that aim. Again, peaceful, stable, secure Arctic region does, needs to include our friends from the Indo-Pacific. And for us, we will try to work that through our good friends down at the NUA Center. Okay, very interesting. You want to add something to that? Or? I would just add briefly, you know, a lot of the challenges we're talking about here, we're talking about the Arctic specifically, but these are global challenges, climate, um, security, uh, scientific um, 
challenges. Um, and um, none of us, not even the United States, can solve any of them alone, which is why we we are emphasizing uh, work with our partners um, and our allies. And there are many uh, partners of all of us and allies in, in Asia, and they have an important role to play here. Um, and so, you know, we welcome that involvement. Great. So thanks to all of you. We are looking forward to your continuing participation. And, and Mike was absolutely right that the Arctic Circle Assembly last October, uh, even if there were just a few weeks since some of you were in office, we, you came to the assembly and presented the view of the new American administration. And we are indeed looking forward to the American presence at the assembly in October. We are not going to have any formal break but we will continue directly into the next plenary session that will follow uh, in the afternoon. Thank you very much. <laughs>